Well, thanks for, for showing up this morning. Uh, for me, it's kind of early, but um, it's good to see folks here wanting to, to look at target and target anomaly detection and hyperspectral imaging. And I thought that um, I'd show a little bit of the basics just to get everybody on the same page as you know, what is hyperspectral imaging. The idea is, is to have you know, an image, you know, just like you take a picture of anything, it's just that at every pixel instead of RGB, we're gonna have a spectrum that's being measured. And so we call um, you know, that pixel is a spectrum and a voxel is just one wave like that on that particular spectrum. So it's pretty simple. It's just that the question is, is, you know, how do you use this to get information? And the wonderful, wonderful thing about um, hyperspectral is that when you have heterogeneous samples, um, even though you might have small signals where the quantities would be low on a volume basis, they can be uh, very strong in, in a single pixel. They can actually dominate the, the sig signal in a, in a whole pixel. And also something that uh, we forget sometimes because we get in the lab and think about our signal so much is that everything else is the interferences. And we get tons of pixels that are fantastic for uh, allowing us to characterize the, the clutter, the background interferences and noise. And that we can use to our advantage to help detect these small signals. So another part of the basics is we go back to looking at, uh, you know, principal components analysis. We use that for anomaly detection. And we use Hotelling's T squared. And we try to find, you know, things that stick out in unusual directions based on this weighted scores. Well, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about is this weighting, is that you already know about weighting techniques. You know, we've got our scores we're weighting by the eigenvalues or the variance in each of these directions. And it means that what I've done is I've essentially <clears throat> made this ellipse on the left-hand side become uh, a sphere or a circle. And then we have these morphed, if you are a warped uh, new uh, scores that have been weighted. And Statisticians like to call that a, a whitening step because you could see that my, you know, ellipse now looks like a circle, so it's sort of whitening. I, I, I want to lean on the word weighting. Right? I like that metaphor because I want to de-weight by certain directions, for example, more than others, and that's how we're going to take advantage of our, our clutter to uh, help us do detection. So I like this example because it, it's a near infrared image that's been masked. This is a uh, scores image on the left-hand side of a cellulose swipe that has uh, something on it. And, and you say, okay, well, do I see an anomaly in that figure? Uh, where is it if I find something? And if seen, can we identify it? And you know, so the, the challenge is, is, do you see it? Well, if I go into Hotelling's T squared, where I do this weighting strategy, you can see, ah, I do have little clumps of something in there. Um, and there's, you know, dots out here and that, that side of it. So I've got an anomaly and, and that's, that's all fine and dandy. Now the idea is, is, can we identify it? Because right now it just might be, you know, the, the joke I tell is, is it could be the powder off the donut that the guy was eating. We don't know what that is yet. Um, so in this detection, what we're, what we're discovering is that the major source of signal is really just junk. There's really nothing of interest there. It's just the cellulose, whereas the signal of interest is actually way down in my eigenvalue distribution. So if I look at this as my information, I mean, this is five orders of magnitude lower. And you know, truth is, is I'm not centering here, but the signal of interest is way down at the bottom. It's not the, not the major signal. And we're going to try to find out what that anomaly is. <clears throat> so what we like about anomaly detection is that it's, it's flexible. Uh, minor anomalies may be difficult to detect. For example, we saw little dots in that screen. They may or may not be anomalies, could just be noise. Um, doesn't identify the signal, though. And so we start getting into things like library search. And then you go, well, is the spectrum in my library actually relevant because of environmental impact, matrix effects, et cetera? 
and we may have to do additional processing to uh, take impure signals so that they look like our library spectrum even better. So, okay, we got into T squared, it's a weighting. And that weighting is directly related to a concept that we're gonna work with here called generalized least squares. And we're gonna use the GLS uh, weighting to declutter or to account for the interferences in, in our um, measured signal. And some people would call this clutter suppression as well. So we're gonna uh, do a, an example next. My next slide is gonna have a, a picture on it. And what I'm going to do in that example is I'm gonna use this weighting to de-weight clusters where the intra-class variance is gonna be de-weighted and therefore, it's going to allow this interclass or between class variance to, to grow up. And the way we do that is we take my data, my original data, and I'm going to de weight by the intra class variance. So, this weighting strategy is just like the T squared, where we get these warp signals, if you will, where we're trying to de weight by this guy. Now, some of the nerdy stuff here is, is that if I've got to take an inverse, Sometimes we've got to do a regularization, and I don't want to get too crazy talking about that part just now, but you can imagine ridge regression where you set your, your ridge parameter to a spot where the condition number of W has your desired uh, size. Typically, you set it so it's about where the noise level is in principal components analysis. So here's the example, and Don Dahlberg took this data a long time ago where he's got uh, FTIR data in, on, on different oils, corn, margarine, olive oil, corn oil, safflower oil. And you can see that the, the ellipses here all seem to kind of almost go in the same direction. And that intra-class ellipse is really going to be clutter. And I'm going to de-weight by that intra-class on, on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my ridging and as I increase that ridge parameter, the condition number increases, my weighting increases. And so I'm gonna de-weight harder. And so I zoomed out so you could see what happens. We start the movie up and you just go, well, I've separated my classes tremendously here compared to the intra-class variability. And I was just doing weighting, that's all it was. Uh, for honesty, maybe this is probably a little bit of overfit, and the fact is, if I keep going, increase that number, I can make those, those clusters look like dots. And it's definitely overfit, but it's kind of fun to see. Um, so we've got our detection algorithms. We contrast anomaly detection that's just finding unusual signal in any direction. If we start talking about target detection, I'm gonna pick a very specific direction associated with a spectrum of interest, for example. And I'm gonna put it into this warp space and you can see that I've got this anomaly here, I would detect because it's got a high projection onto that particular direction. Meanwhile, this anomaly is not gonna be captured because it's orthogonal to this guy. So you don't get any signal from that one. So you can see some selectivity in, in the directions that you're picking in this weighted space. So let's go back to the example with the cellulosic swipe. Here is the PCA, and we looked at the hoteling T squared, and this is the results here. And this is the equation for the GLS target detection. I don't want you to, you know, look at this too hard, but you can see that I'm de-weighting my X and my spectrum to put them into this weighted environment. And so this is the signal. This is the weighting, and the weighting that I'm going to use here is going to be the entire set of pixels in this image. And there's my target. So I've got a very specific target here. And this is what I get when I use the RDX target, which is an explosive on the cellulosic swipe. You get very few false alarms out here like I did here. And, and these globs of target are much cleaner on this side. So I think uh, I like this example because it sort of feels like it pokes you in the eye. Um, the other part of this is that I can, I can impose non-negativity on this equation. And that makes sense because you're looking at non-negative signals. So why, why wouldn't you do that? 
this is really the same equation as this one. It's just that I'm looking at it in weighted space. It's the classical least squares model for S in the weighted environment. I like that metaphor. Here's another example. This is a, a wheat gluten uh, in a sample cup near infrared. I've got standards in the corners. I'm plotting the spectra for everything that's in this uh, red dashed line. You can see that on the right-hand side. And what I wanna do is I wanna find adulterants in wheat gluten. And the example I'm gonna look for is a target of melamine in wheat gluten. And I'm gonna mask my image to just be inside this sample cup. So this is what unadulterated wheat gluten looks like in reflectance. Then we go into the um, uh, minus log and I took a one norm. I've got my target and here's all the, the samples in this particular image on the right hand side. I know that I have 56 parts per million by weight and I've got a detection right there. Tiny little guy out there. And you can see that here's the distribution of the pixels that most of these pixels, the wheat gluten is down here. And my detection, this guy is out here on this area. And I can start playing with this by squishing down on the red one and squishing up on the green one. And I can kind of almost binarize the image and see, aha, I've got a detection there. But if I look real close, I've even got something small there, something small there. And what is it? What does it look like? So let's go in due diligence, look at that dot. And this is what the five or six pixels that were detected look like. And you see, basically it's this peak right there is really the only thing that's showing up. So it's a very tiny signal that we're finding amongst all of this junk. Target detection is pretty sensitive in that way. Uh, we can also use iteration. So in this past example, I use this entire image as my de-weighting matrix. What that means is that I'm de-weighting by this signal as well as all of this signal. And when I de-weight by this signal, that means that I'm going to have, you know, a loss of sensitivity. So what I can do is I can iterate. I can remove detections from, from my uh, clutter matrix and then reperform the detection uh, process. And so you can see, I highlighted this particular matrix. This is the part that says that here's the variance of my detection uh, estimates. And this says that if I de-weight by directions that are parallel to this guy, my estimation error increases. So if I remove stuff that's parallel to this from the clutter, I should improve my sensitivity. And with the 56 parts per million, it really doesn't make a difference <clears throat> because that, that's such a tiny, tiny signal that I'm not really de-weighting by much. I have a 200 ppm example I'll show here in a little bit. And in just three short iterations, I, I got a couple more detections. It wasn't a whole bunch, but it was uh, a little bit more sensitive. And we really do expect this, that kind of an approach, the iteration approach to, uh, to make more of a difference when we have a much larger uh, amount of target signal present. So let's talk about how this works, what's going on in the background. So if you imagine that I've got a spectrum that I'm plotting up here on channel one and channel two or variable uh, one and two, wavelength one and two, frequency one and two, and I've got clutter that's pointing off in this direction, we can do a principal components analysis of that clutter. So in this case, in my example, I'm gonna say that my noise is about <clears throat> this big. So PC, PC2 is gonna be uh, corresponding to noise. PC1 is gonna be the correlated clutter uh, that we're going to try to account for. Well, if I look at my target and I do nothing, you can see that it projects right down <clears throat> onto this interference that signal would be detected and it would be a bias and it would be a false alarm. So the portion of S that's being projected onto my interference can result in false alarms. Now this portion 
which is just noise, you can see that if I orthogonalize um, to this clutter direction, then this is the direction that I would be leaning on to make my detections. And so I'd be having a, a noise level here and anything that projects out here is, would be considered a detection. Well, that direction is actually the net outlet signal with respect to this direction. So this is my clutter, my main clutter direction. This is my target and this would be my net outlet signal. So you'll see people using uh, external parameter orthogonalization as one of the ways to get rid of this stuff. And when you do that, that leaves behind this net outlet signal direction for your detections. But when we do de-weighting, I'm gonna squish down on this guy and try to make him uh, more round, more like a sphere. And as I start squishing down, you can see that I'm rotating my target spectrum towards the net outlet signal. But when I get down to where I'm at, at about the noise level, my weighted target has been shrunk, it's been rotated, but it's not shrunk as much as the EPO filter would have done. So you can see that this is a little bit softer and it means that I don't de-weight as hard. I, I retain a little more net outlet signal than I do with EPO. And so this is our GLS equation that we hang on to. The, the EPO filter down here is from the extended least squares model. You'll hear that name, the extended mixture model. And really, if you took this equation and just tacked on another column to your target, that would be a least squares. That would be the EPO filter. It'd be the same thing. What I like about this is that now I can get some information about this particular direction as well. So I can do some chemical imaging. So if I knew what my P was, I could include that as another, um, spectrum, if you will. We can also say, look, I want to include this particular portion. So this is another way to attack the uh, target detection is to put the interference in with the target and de-weight by everything else. That's essentially the stuff that's going to be, uh, this would be the um, covariance about this particular spectrum. And we can do that iteration as well. So imagine that with the wheat gluten, I start by saying, I'm gonna use my interference is gonna be the median of all the pixels. And the covariance is gonna, uh, the W of my weighting matrix is gonna be the covariance of all the pixels centered about that median. As I find detections, I leave them out of my covariance and I calculate a new, um, interference spectrum. So we can iterate on that too, and it works reasonably well. Uh, we've got a paper on that, if you guys are interested, that uh, is applied to standoff detection. And uh, man, it just works like gangbusters. So now in my 200 ppm example, I can use this ELS GLS target detection to account for the interferences and I'm going to get a little more clever. This time I'm going to add some pre-processing, for example, Svitsky Gole, and I'm going to do a one norm. And so now my target looks like it's got a lot more selectivity compared to what this background spectrum is. When I do my detections, I can calculate my, li my limit based on this estimation error. And that's just a guide. It's not a, you know, I don't, I don't think that the distribution is not. Um, expected to be normally distributed, but we can use this as a guide. And I can uh, make my image here for my target detection. Um, boom, I've got my, my big clump of uh, melamine up here, and you can plot the spectrum, you can see it. But look at this range here. That's a big range compared to what this estimation error is. Even if I took three times that, which would be about there, you can see that my detections are really a long ways away from the, uh, the bottom here at zero. The, the thing I do like about this approach is that I, I get a sanity check. Here's my interference spectrum. So I'm doing chemical imaging. I've got the target, I've got the wheat. And you'll notice that when the target is present, 
I get a hole in my interference spectra uh, detections. And the interferences are, are being covered up. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that we see this complementary um, signal because when the target's present, it's covering up my interference stuff and vice versa. So this is actually a second check. It's a second detection, really. And, and so that's a good sanity check using this approach. And then I can do tricks, like I can start changing my histogram. I can contrast to make my targets look really big and really fat by setting the detection limit way down to here and suppressing those guys there. And I can do the same thing over here uh, to see the holes in my interference image. And that's the kind of thing that you might actually deploy to an operator so that they can try to find these detections and help minimize your false alarm. So let's do a quick summary here. The target that we're looking at, the melamine, for example, was constant image to image. The clutter, though, was image specific. So every time I have a new image, I calculate my clutter, my de-weighting matrix, and that makes it an adaptable model. The really nice thing about that is that I don't have to have a big giant global PLS model. This can be desensitized because I have to include so much stuff in here. Instead, I'm much more local to the image of interest. We also have to keep in mind that our detection thresholds might change depending on, on what our materials are and how their signals change as well. Well, the ELS GLS also adds this background interference that's also image specific, so it's also adaptable. But what happens if the target is not constant image to image? Let's say that I've got a library spectrum that is affected by the matrix itself. You know, it's in the weak gluten, the weak gluten bonds to it or it does something weird cause the target spectrum to move around. So what if that's not constant? Well, if I make detections using my target approach, I can find, you know, anomalies, I can find my targets. Once I find one detection, I can now replace my targets, my spectrum from the library with the actual pixel of interest. So now I'm doing target detection on pixels in the image itself. And so now I've allowed that target spectrum to change. And so now we're adaptive in that direction as well. Well, there's some more fun that can be had. We can de-weight with GLS, we can orthogonalize and de-weight using the ELS-GLS, or we can use whitened principal components analysis, or I like to call it weighted principal components analysis, where my weighting matrix corresponds to all the junk that wasn't my detections that came in from this approach. And so now I've got a principal components analysis model and everybody knows that one. It's just that all we're gonna do is we're gonna add this weighting matrix. And now my loadings are gonna to correspond to multiple image specific manifestations of the target signal. So I might even see you know, PC2 showing up with some weird different way for, for my target um, to show up in real um, samples. So we can start with the library. Uh, we take an anomaly or a target of interest or something and what I mean by this is, imagine that you've got a, a medical image where somebody's looking at a hyperspectral image of, of skin and uh, somebody identifies, aha, that really is melanoma. Well, now I've got an image that's specific to me. I have all this clutter. I've got the target signal that's specific to me. And now I can use this approach to find the melamine all over in this image, anywhere on my skin. So we're gonna use the first couple of detections as the new target signal, and we, and we do that iteration procedure to change our weighting matrix so we enhance our sensitivity. So let's go take a look at an example. This is uh, a Landsat image. There's only eight wavelengths or eight bands in this image. This is uh, Lake Chelan. So I'm actually, uh, this is one end of Lake Chelan. This is the Northwest end. I'm sitting presently on the south uh, end of, of this lake. 
Um, it's 55 miles long. And you can see that there's, you know, an apparent river here and all this bright uh, yellow stuff corresponds to mountains and clouds and that kind of stuff. Well, let's try this de-weighting strategy where I find non-water pixels and we start doing our de-weighting. So I start de-weighting by the non-water and it looks like all of a sudden the, my clouds get very bright over here on the left-hand side and then they get suppressed and then my water starts coming out. And so I see lakes, this is Donkey Lake, this is uh, Surprise Lake, these are the old lakes been camping out there and Cub Lake have been camping out there as well. So I'm finding water, but we also have to be careful that we've got you know, things that look like clouds here as well. So we're using some of our spatial information when we look at an image like this to help guide us on detections as well. Uh, and let's see, here's another example. Um, this is a uh, Dunlop broadside printing of the Declaration of Independence. And we got this from good folks at the Library of Congress. And you can see it, we've got one color here, one color here and a PCA uh, plot or um, image of these guys. You see two major sources of clutter, it just looks like you know, a big mess in there. But if you look careful, you can start to see something in here. It almost looks like a watermark. Well, if I now start using this watermark as my target, so I leave it out of the weighting matrix and de-weight by everything else. Let's see if we can bring that thing out. So this is a brand new movie for me. I turned it side, sideways and I'm gonna start adding my uh, de-weighting strategy. And uh, I'm increasing my condition number. So the weighting is increasing. And you start seeing a little bit of this watermark start poking out of the background as we start de-weighting. Earlier, I talked about how you could overfit by your de-weighting strategy. And the truth is, is you can uh, overfit. But if I'm looking for something like writing, maybe it's okay to overfit as long as I can start reading what's coming out of the background here in this image. And then once I identify that stuff, I can start playing with things like my color maps to try to enhance different portions of it so I can uh, potentially interpret what's going on. And there's another color map there. Okay. Another uh, application, uh, and this came from the Library of Congress and a, and a good friend of mine, Don Dahlberg, uh, shared these uh, images with me and we did a little bit of this uh, weighted PCA. You can see this is a 15th century uh, um, document from a Greek monastery, I believe. And if you, zoom in you start seeing hints of, of a little bit of writing in the background there and what we're going to try to do is pick a couple of regions and we're going to to um, try to enhance that background writing doing the same strategy that we had in the previous example so here's what it looks like in, in my first principal component and then i start adding my decluttering and it takes a little bit of time and all of a sudden you start seeing stuff poking out of the background. You work on it until you get some writing that you think you can interpret. And I can't interpret that stuff because it's ancient Greek, but I can zoom in on it with different color maps and we can start uh, maybe getting somebody to translate for us. Uh, the next section, we have pretty much the same idea is that it takes a little while, but as we increase that uh, condition number on our weighting matrix, the ridging parameter, we de-weight by more and more of the background. And in the end, we get something that we might be able to read or at least start to interpret. With that, I'd like to bring down the conclusions and talk about these weighting strategies as, as really in a radar analogy when we start looking at airplanes. And I got this slide from Don. He came up with this idea. I, I really liked it. You can imagine, if you will, that I'm looking with my radar for airplanes, if I'm an air traffic controller, well, that means that if I've got something like birds and, and clouds, that's actually my clutter. So I want to suppress that clutter so I can get the signal out here. However, imagine that I'm at the, at the same airport and I'm using the same radar, 
but I'm interested in the weather. So I want to, I want to see this guy, and that means that the birds and the airplanes are, are cluttered. That's why I talk about waiting instead of whitening, because one person's clutter is really another person's signal. And so I'm going to de-weight by the signal I'm not interested in. And I'm going to use each of these tools, each of these strategies synergistically. I'm not going to throw them into a bucket and make them compete because I want to use all the information I possibly can. And finally, we're no longer doing maximization of signal to noise. Instead, we're really trying to maximize signal to clutter when we go out into the environmental applications. And with that, I'll see if you've got any questions.